Um, so today's sermon is implementing the resurrection because it's it's really important that we that we do this implementing we we do such a good job at we do such a good job at feeling uh, you know lint and and sadness and, and repentance and then we get to Holy Week and we're so good at you know waving palms and, and pounding nails and then when Easter comes we have fun and then we say. Glad that's over. Now we can go back to planting tomatoes or whatever it is we want to do, right? The pastor goes on vacation. The choir director leaves for the Bahamas. Um, that's the way it works, right? But, but that's precisely the backwards order, I think. And that's why we're having a celebration brunch today because Jesus is alive. Now is the time to be celebrating, Okay, now is the time to be celebrating. So that's why everyone is certainly welcome to this wonderful brunch. And I mean wonderful brunch that the ladies are putting on after worship for us today. So Landon, if you might hit the next slide. Let's begin. Um, this was where I was yesterday. <laughs> no, okay, so I'm a complete liar. Uh, no, so the ocean, right? Everybody, not everybody, many people love to go to the ocean and see the beauty and the grandeur. Can it, somebody shout out, where's your favorite ocean spot? North of Oahu, North Shore. Okay. Is that where the big waves are? Cool. You went surfing there, I'm assuming. Yes, yes. Penny and Tim hanging tin on the 40-foot wave. Somebody else. Lake Superior? Okay, okay, water. Boundary waters. Okay, all right. We're from Minnesota. Don't make us, you know, say too much. We don't get to the oceans very often, right? That's why Wisconsin calls it the West Coast, the Mississippi River, right? But the, but the ocean is a lot of fun and glorious and powerful. Um, you know, my, my favorite spot, when, when, when I got my doctorate, we went to celebrate. We went to the, um, to the Outer Banks of um, North Carolina. Beautiful place. And, you know, I was from Wyoming up in the mountains and listening to the waves crash every night on the shore, thinking, man, if some big tsunami comes, we're all dunners. Um, you know, that's how powerful it is, right? It's beautiful, but it's terrifying all at the same time. And so, let me just picture this for you. Imagine, you know, the glory and the power and the majesty of God's oceans or the boundary waters or, you know, even the Mississippi, for crying out loud, and, and walking up to the shore and, and, and taking a glass and reaching down, filling up that glass and saying, behold, the purpose of such said body of water is to fill my cup. That's the only reason this exists, to fill my cup. Right? All of us would shake our head and say, are you mad? That is not why that water exists. That's not the sole point of that water. But you know what, guys? As Christians, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that the glory and the power and the beauty and the grandeur of our God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter morning was to fill our little grace cups. Instead of seeing the mighty ocean, the vastness, the power and the, and the grace and the humility, but the power and the grace and love of Jesus and God, we say the only purpose of God is to give me a warm, tingly feeling. And we hold our little grace personal cup up and say, that's it. Now, now, very true. Don't get me wrong. God is there to fill our lives, our cup, our, our, our very vessels with grace and, and mercy and love. But to say that's the only purpose of God is to say that the only purpose of the ocean is to fill a, a bucket. It is so much more than that. It is huge. We have most often, sometimes, maybe, roundabout way, a far too small vision of our God. We have a small vision of what Easter really is. <clears throat> on that morning, church, on that morning of Easter, God, the waves of God's renewal began crashing upon the old shores of despair in His creation. And the power of God comes to bear to fix what went wrong with sin and death and decay as God's new creation launches. That is the ocean of God. 
Now, very true. We can fill our little cups. But okay, Aaron, so what if, what if, <clears throat> if, I'm, if that's not the full point? <clears throat> goodness, <clears throat> excuse me. If that's not the full point, then what, what's my job here? And I'm glad you asked. I've got some ideas for that. So let's, let me say this. Here, Landon, the next, here's the main point, everybody. The church's mission is, is to outwork the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, and I summed it up. We live in the resurrection. Our job is to work out the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our job is to outwork implement, make real the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. That's our job. Now, we, sometimes we do horribly at it. Sometimes we say stupid things we're ashamed of and do things we're ashamed But no, overall, this is our job. And so taking the big things in step here, our, we're going to read John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. So if you have a Bible or your pew Bible in front of you, I would encourage you to take up your Bible or that Bible and turn to John, Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Last Sunday, Easter Sunday, we did 1 through 18, the, the, the first day, the early morning resurrection of Jesus. Now today we're picking it up again one week later, I mean that night and then one week later, the story of Jesus appearing to his followers. So here we go, chapter 20, verse 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, there's my phrase, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands... And I put my finger in that mark of the nails and my hand in his side. I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house. And Thomas was with them you know, this time. And although the doors were still shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Verse 28, Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. That's you. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you might come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Okay, so how do we join? Landon, if, uh, if you might hit the next one. How, how, do we, how do we join with Jesus? If thinking of that, that mighty ocean, how do we join with God in this? If, if God's purpose isn't just to fill our cup, how do we participate in this? Well, because of this verse right here. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I send you. So, in the upper room that night, the disciples were hiding because they were fearful of being killed. Just as Jesus had been killed a couple of days before, they were hiding there, wondering what was to become of them. And Jesus comes and stands among them, walks through the walls or the doors or whatever, <clears throat> and says to them, peace be with you. And then I think the second, 
the second sentence, as the Father has sent me, so I send you, is another great commission. So often we hear the great commission being that piece at the end of Matthew, right? Um, as you're going into all the world, uh, teach people what I've taught you to obey and keep my commandments and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know what? I think this one is just as good. Might be even better. As the Father has sent me, I send you. Because church, we believe that, do you believe that the resurrection of Jesus changes everything? I mean, really, do you believe that the resurrection has anything? Well, I, I'm not so sure. We, we do really well with the cross. Christians, you know, often in America here, we do really well with the cross. Jesus died for forgiveness of sins and, and that line, and that's really true. And then when it comes to Easter morning, we get a little bit fuzzy and we're like, well, uh, uh, God needed him back in heaven? And rose him, and she, no, 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 oh no, it comes much better than that, right? So Jesus raises from the dead, and Easter morning is this new life. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And as he is sent by the Father, he sends us. So everything you see Jesus doing, do that. Everything you think of Jesus being, be that. Everything you think of Jesus saying, say that. You'll notice Jesus doesn't say, be religious people here. He says, I send you, not I pusit you. I send you to be Jesus people, resurrection people, life-giving people. If Jesus came to bring reconciliation to God... We go and bring reconciliation to God in the same way. If Jesus came to, to end exile for those who feel far away from God, we come to re announce return from exile in Jesus' name. If Jesus came to forgive sins, we are those who forgive sins. What? We can't, I, I know what you mean. But have you ever had somebody confess to you and cry to you? Weep to you that, man, I've, I've, I've really messed up. Maybe because they harmed you, and we all do that a lot. Or maybe because they did something in their past and they can't get through and they don't think God loves them. And you can say to them, as a, in a priestly function, I know God has forgiven you. Because that's who God is, as shown through Jesus. Right? If Jesus forgives sin, the church for those who seek it, is there to offer forgiveness. And then there's that piece in there, if, if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. What does that mean? Well, you know what that means. Uh, have you ever met that, that encountered those situations that are unrepentantly evil and harmful and oppressive and wicked? Christians' jobs are to hold those sins against and hold accountable. This might apply to larger things, larger uh, environmental things, larger governmental things, oppressive governments or harmful institutions or cultural norms in people's hearts and minds that harm themselves and other people. We hold those things accountable because Jesus held evil accountable. And we are sent to do the same thing. And, and just as a side note, evil does not like it when you hold it accountable. Um, uh, it ends up usually ending poorly for the holder. But if we're Christ people who pick up that cross and follow him, that's kind of the ticket, right? Um. <laughs> hey, what a great uplifting message, Aaron. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Cheer up. <laughs> because there's hope. That's the hope, right? That's the hope, everybody. If, if Christ came... To do this, you know what, our hope, there is hope. What, what kind of hope are you talking about? Our hope is mission-shaped hope. Our hope is mission-shaped hope around this resurrection of Jesus. Our hope, our mission comes out of that resurrection of Jesus. A hope for the renewal of all things. Renewal of all things. You'll notice there's room in here for my soul to get saved and me to go to heaven when I die. Yes, yes, yes. But this is much bigger than that. It's the renewal of all things in which my life happens to be one little minuscule piece. The renewal of all things. If 
Jesus came, and as he stepped out of that tomb, he overcame death and decay and sin and evil. And as he begins to fill the cosmos with God's love and glory, that's the renewal of all things. Do you see here again, back to the, back to the analogy of the ocean and the cup, we're talking filling the cosmos with the glory of God rather than just a single vessel. That is the beauty and the glory of the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. <clears throat> And then on that, on that night, you know, the peace be with you. Jesus breathes on the disciples and says, peace be with you. Now, now, why would he do that? I mean, was Jesus trying out some new breath mints? And hey, guys, try this out. <sighs> Isn't that fruity? You know, like, Jesus, stop. You always breathe on us. No, 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 that's not it. Back to Genesis chapter 1. How did God bring to life the very first people? He breathed on them. How does Jesus bring to life his disciples? Peace be with you. And he breathes the Holy Spirit upon them and into them. The Holy Spirit who is the seal and the promise of what God has done in all creation and in your life and in my life. The Holy Spirit who enables us to stand when the storm winds blow. The Holy Spirit who enables us to stand up and go to places when other people will not go there. And to forgive when forgiveness is never warranted. To be those people who are themselves speakers of peace in a world of violence and war and pain and greed and wickedness and hate. Those who speak peace and live into reality the resurrection of our Jesus. The Holy Spirit who forgives us and assures us that we are loved when we are weak and on our knees. The Holy Spirit who enables us to be the church together even though you may disagree with me and I disagree with you. The Holy Spirit who enables the worldwide church to be together even though it is vastly different from different cultures and different beliefs being the resurrected body of our Christ. The Holy Spirit upon us and in us who enables us to shine in the beauty of our King. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Next slide if you would. Now, the next piece here is about Thomas, right? Old doubting Thomas. How are we to implement the the, the resurrection of of Jesus? And the lesson comes from the faith drawn from all of us Thomases. And by the way, spell check doesn't like Thomases, right? Thomases. I I wish LaVon was here. I'd ask her how to spell Thomases because I put an E-S on the end of it. Thomases. How do you do plural Thomas? Yeah, right? I'll I'll leave that up to you guys. Thomases. It's from all of us Thomases. Or or if we're speaking Latin, all of us Thomas I. I I don't know. So now listen to this. Okay, so here's here's Thomas. Thomas didn't believe. We call him Doubting Thomas, right? You can even find things on on the internet that disparages poor Thomas. And I totally stole this one off of DuckDuckGo. Um... So here's Thomas. He's like, man, I'm not believing nothing. I haven't seen anything. You know, I see nothing. I know nothing right now. Now, so Jesus comes again a week later, and Thomas is there. When, when Thomas is, is face-to-face with this resurrected Jesus, this, this God-made flesh, Thomas doesn't put he has fingers in, in the holes. And by the way, holes were never right there. Nails would never hold in your palms, would they? They'd just slip right out. Ask, ask our doctor friends. You put nails in there where it has something to hook on to. So Jesus was like, put them there, man. And Thomas, Thomas says, no. And we see him fall to his knees and he cries out, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. So now here's the interesting part about Doubting Thomas. I'm going to change his name from Doubting Thomas to Faithful Thomas. You know why? Because 
all the way through the Gospel of John, you have Jesus telling these boys who he is. And they're like, who is this guy? You have Jesus showing him who he is. And they're like, man, wow, this guy can do stuff. You have Jesus being with these guys all the way through. And doubting Thomas is the only one who says, who gets it right and falls to his knees and says, my Lord and my God. He's not so much doubting. He was just needing to see. And now he's the faithful Thomas. Irony of all ironies. He's the only one in the gospel that gets it, who Jesus really is. Finally. And you know what, guys? We're all Thomases. Thomas I. We're, we're all Thomases because we've all doubted at some point. Maybe you're doubtful this morning. Right? We all want proof. It's, Jesus said there, blessed are those who believe and have not seen me because they, he knew it's easy to believe in something when you can actually physically touch it. It's harder to believe in something when you've not seen it and can't touch it. Jesus says, blessed are you who believe in him who believe and haven't seen but we've all been Thomases. We've all wished we've had that great faith, right? We may, we may look around the church building here and, and we may say, man, I wish I had faith like sister what's her name or, or brother such and such. I, I wish I had faith like them. Or we may see some people from another church who, who stand up loudly and proclaim that they believe. And we're like, boy, that's just not me. I, you know, by, by the way, just to, you know this, but when you speak the loudest, oftentimes you have the most doubts. <laughs> like in preacher's notes, sometimes it says weak content, cry or scream here, right? <laughs> Little content, be emotional. <laughs> we all want to be those people that are loud and boisterous, but in fact, we're Thomases and and from out of our hearts, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, whether we meet him or however it works, he, he draws that faith out of us so that we can say, my Lord and my God, and fall to our knees. We believe that dead guys most of the time stay dead. We, <laughs> old timers knew that too back in Jesus' day, man. They, those old folks, they knew dead people stayed dead too. But they believed anyway that Jesus brings this faith out of us, drawn out of our doubtful hearts and yet bringing us into belief so that we might be partners with God in implementing this resurrection. And let me, let me wind it up with this. Next slide, please. So guys, Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is alive. And I don't mean wispy, ghosty, ghosty Jesus sitting on a cloud somewhere strumming a harp. I mean flesh and blood, pinch him, he'll scream. Jesus is alive. Bodily resurrection came out of the tomb. Are you all just sitting there looking at me like, yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Thank you, sister. <laughs> That's, what, that's the good news, right? Death, sin, and decay have been defeated in Christ the King. And the church's mission, our job, is to implement that resurrection in the world around us. We anticipate the time when Jesus comes back, when the old is passed on and the new is made, and we're all new, and the dead in Christ rise, and we reign with him forever. That's what we anticipate, right? And now we work that into existence now. You know, it, it, a little funny thing here. I'll give you a little bit of textual. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes this massive 50 what verse chapter to the church in Corinth about the resurrection of Christ. And then at the very end of it, he, he, he doesn't end it in a big fanfare and woohoo, trumpets, and you know, 
the confetti cannons, which I'm still finding confetti, by the way. He doesn't end it in confetti. He says, because what you do will stand. In Christ's name, what you do in, in Christ's name will stand. So church, let me say to you this. What you do in Christ's name will stand into the next life. What you do in Christ's name for the good of God and the good of other people will stand. As you implement the resurrection, it will stand into the next life. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking serious. And I'll, I'll give you some examples here in just a second. So don't think that our job is merely to get our souls saved so that we can go to heaven when we die, although it is. Don't think that our job is merely to be concerned about people being religious, uh, although partly I suppose it is. Modern life wants to push the church aside and say, you guys just be sky pilots, right? You guys just be in here, because when you're just in here, you're irrelevant. So you stay over there and do this and be religious while we take care of real life. I would encourage you to not believe that and not to be dulled down and thrown aside on the trash heap of religion, but I would encourage you to be the sharp as a knife edge church of the living God who calls to account the evil in the world because it has been redeemed to change and implement the resurrection. We are tasked with implementing the resurrection of Jesus in time and space and matter. And I told you, I told, I gave, I told you I'd give you some examples. Let me give you some examples. We are tasked with implementing Jesus' redemption in space, time, and matter. And so here, if we are, if Jesus is Lord of space, and I'm, uh, okay, Sputnik or, you know, the International Space Station, whatever, George Jetson. But no, I'm talking about space. If Jesus is a Lord of space, everybody, we work with our town in the interest of beauty, in the interest of architecture. We are for parks that make this space lovely and generous to all. We work in favor of traffic patterns because that, that are, that are life-giving instead of life-sucking. <laughs> What, Jesus is concerned with traffic patterns? Yeah, baby, he is. Because if Jesus is Lord of all creation, heaven and earth, he's also Lord of your traffic patterns and your house and the parks and the trees. Jesus is, oh yeah, here, here again, let's talk about this. What kind of Jesus do you want? Do you want little cup Jesus or do you want ocean Jesus? Right? Do you want little cup Jesus or do you want ocean Jesus? I would particularly care for ocean Jesus. Myself, And so if Jesus is all space and time, he is those who call us to implement the resurrection in housing, in architecture, in beauty, in parks. If Jesus is the Lord of all time, then we work to humanize, we work to humanize the work week. We don't demand that people work 24-7 just so that we can have a Wendy's cheeseburger at 3 in the morning. Right? We don't demand that people work themselves to the bone and be un, you know, not valued at their job or have a job that's not dignifying. We are for those who are redeeming time. We are those who work to promote days off for people. We are those who observe holy days and festival weeks. We are those who, because Jesus is the Lord of your week as well. When you walk out the door, you are taking sacred space with you and sacred time. So when you, when you go to your job tomorrow morning or even this afternoon, you are taking sacred time to that job. Redeemed by Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Right? When you're in your car, sacred time. If Jesus is the Lord of all matter, we take responsibility for this earth and all the things in the world that God has made. How would that be? Well, we would farm responsibly. Right? We would uh, recycle. We would recycle. We would run playgrounds for single parents, right? Or places to, like, parents night out here in our fellowship hall so that moms and dads could get some time off. 
We organize credit unions for those in poverty so that we might teach them how to save and be with them. We would work for affordable housing in our communities because Jesus is Lord of all of these things. So church, we are transformed on the inside. Yes, God fills our cup to overflowing. Thanks be to God for that. But that is just a portion of what God intends to do through you and through the resurrection. Because our God is a mighty, mighty rushing ocean of grace and mercy and transformative action. Be transformed on the inside and then turn it to the outside and implement that resurrection. That is the church's job. That is how we become relevant. That is how our faith changes us and changes the world. Amen.